everyone. In this video, I'd like to discuss a bit about the reality behind the Islamic Golden Age. Now, this may be a controversial topic for many Muslims to accept, and especially those who have a very romanticized view of uh, the medieval Islamic world, as well as the impact of, of the Islamic religion on uh, world history. But nonetheless, uh, my point here is to prove that uh, the Islamic Golden Age was not, in fact, a product of the Islamic religion. Rather, it was a product of the pre-established civilizations, especially that of the Persians. You know, the majority of Islamic scholars from this period were actually of Iranian origin, specifically Persians, and not of Arab origins. And the religion of Islam actually had a very little uh, influence on these sciences, as well as these... Uh, uh, the emergence, rather, the emergence of the sciences during this period, as well as uh, all of this great uh, learning and knowledge, which was uh, which was mostly cultivated by uh, the uh, what remained of uh, the ancient uh, Persian tradition, as well as the traditions of the Romans, the Byzantines, the Greeks, uh, specifically the ancient Hellenes, as well as those of uh, China and India. Oftentimes, many Muslims actually claim, uh, you know, they say, yeah, you know, back uh, during the thousand years ago, a thousand uh, Islam was uh, at its peak, and this was largely due to the Islamic religion and the exploits of the Arabs, you know, they specifically point to the Arabs, and even the Arabs uh, use this as a point of national pride, they say, you know, our religion, this was our scholarship and our religion, and look what we achieved, we achieved so much, when in actuality, much of the exploits of the Islamic Golden Age actually came from Persians, as well as other non-Arabs, such as those inhabiting Spain, those from Mesopotamia, as well as those from uh, China and parts of India. So, you know, the main thing here is that the Islamic Golden Age was not a product of the Islamic religion or the exploits of the Arabs. Rather, it was a product of the pre-existing civilizations, which were already in place, and pre-existing traditions, which were already in place. And in this video, I'll specifically look at the uh, traditions of the Persians, the pre-Islamic uh, Persians. And uh, I will not really focus on the other traditions, but nonetheless, it should be noted that uh, many of these uh, Islamic, quote-unquote, Islamic scholars were actually uh, Iranians, and uh, these Iranian scholars had very esoteric uh, worldviews. And it should also be noted that these worldviews would not be accepted today by, uh, you know, they would not be accepted today or then by these so-called mainstream Muslims who are very proud of this aspect of their heritage, but nonetheless they fail to realize that most of these Iranian scholars and most of the great scholars of the so-called Islamic Golden Age actually were not even very strong adherents of the Islamic faith. So to begin, uh, prior to the rise of the uh, Arab Caliphates, uh, Iran was a major center of intellect, uh, and uh, the primary uh, major, the real major uh, center of Iranian uh, intellectual output was the library of Gundishapur, also known as the Academy of Gundishapur. And this was a major cultural center, not only in terms of intellectual output, but also a place where ideas were exchanged between the Eastern and Western worlds, the Western world obviously being the realm of the Byzantine Empire and the Roman Empire before it. But nonetheless, this library was an important center of culture as well as of uh, intellectual output. And uh, this actually, what ended up happening was uh, this library pro produced many great uh, pre-Islamic Iranian scholars, most notably Borzuya, who was an intellectual uh, unlike any before him. And he made so many great uh, contributions to medicine, as well as he also introduced the game of chess to Iran from uh, India. So that's another aspect. And... Uh, Another thing here is that this library was mostly destroyed during the Arab invasion, but nonetheless much of it was preserved and the Arabs later borrowed much of this knowledge, not for themselves though, they had, they, the, much of this knowledge was actually preserved and uh, it was translated by the Mesopotamian scholars uh, such as Hunayn ibn Ishaq and again many of these Mesopotamian scholars were not even Muslims, they were Christians, but nonetheless my point here is that the origins of the Islamic Golden Age lay specifically, for the most part, lay in the pre-Islamic traditions of the Persians. Now, uh, much of Islamic civilization was actually based on uh, these uh, pre-Islamic uh, pre Iranian scholarship and actually many of the great uh, so-called early Islamic scholars such as Al-Razi who was a famous physician such as uh, Ibn Sina, another major physician 
such as uh, Al Khwarizmi, the founder of algebra, or even uh, Jabir ibn Hayyan. Uh, all of these uh, great scholars uh, were uh, Persians, uh, and even the great historians of the time, most notably uh, Al Tabari, was also a Persian. And uh, even uh, you know, I can just go on and on here, but uh, even the great uh, you know the great uh, Arab grammarists, uh, you know the main Arab linguists of the time were also Iranians, most notably Abul Faraj al Isfahani. And this is just only scratching the surface here. You know, then uh, you had uh, various, you know, there were even non-Persian uh, scholars of the time, but even they borrowed a lot of their traditions from pre-Islamic uh, Persian traditions. For instance, uh, the uh, famous, uh, you know, the famous so-called Arabic, uh, you know, uh, there's this story, it's it's like a book of various short stories called Khalila wa Dimna. It was uh, by uh, Al Ibn al-Mukaffa, and he was actually also a Persian, and many Arabs are actually proud of this but in reality uh, much of this actually uh, comes from a pre-islamic persian tradition you know this his uh, khalila wadimna was actually just a translation of uh, just a translation and uh, worked off of uh, the works of borzuya and again you know he borzuya actually introduced this uh, to iran uh, from uh, the uh, Sanskrit uh, traditions and it was later improved by individuals such as Ibn al-Mukaffa, Borne, Ruzba, Pure, Dudui as well as uh, Rudaki. So that's another important thing to keep in mind here. Rudaki obviously being the famous Iranian poet of the 12th century. And uh, sorry again if my uh, voice is a bit loud. Uh, I actually have to talk a bit loud because there's a lot of background noise and I have to uh, make sure that it doesn't get, like it's not noticeable. So sorry if uh, you've uh, noticed that about my videos uh, recently. But actually uh, that's pretty much the reason why uh, I have to speak a bit loudly. But if it's too loud for you, you can just uh, turn down the volume. Furthermore, uh, even uh, much, you know, uh, Ibn Sina's work, The Canon of Medicine, was actually used as a European textbook up until the uh, up until the 17th 18th centuries and uh, this again shows the long lasting influence of the Iranian scientists and uh, you know many of the early uh, scholars of the Islamic golden age the majority of them were not even Arabs you know some of them spoke Arabic nonetheless they were either Mesopotamians they were either North Africans or they were either uh, Spaniards and uh, you know the actual Arab contributions here were very, very limited. By Arabs, I obviously mean, uh, you know, those from the Arabian Peninsula. Now, I'm not being racist here or anything. I'm just stating the facts. And if any Arabs want to debate this with me, they can. But nonetheless, the, the, there's a reason why the uh, majority of the centers of the great Islamic, uh, the old Islamic world were in Iran or in uh, uh, Iraq or in uh, what is today Iraq rather or in uh, even Syria you know Damascus or in Spain there was very little intellectual uh, heart, you know intellectual centers in the Arabian Peninsula and uh, this actually is very true because most of the Arab population at the time were just Bedouins so they were not even settled and they rarely moved out you know the ones who did settle overseas many of them may have later become scholars but nonetheless the majority of the scholars of the so-called islamic golden age were actually iranians and other non-arabs now many arabs may actually counter and say well why you know if uh, al khwarizmi or ibn sina were not arabs why did they write most of their works in the arabic language and the reason for that is quite simple it's because uh, of the ruling elite at the time they preferred arabic as a la as a language of knowledge because of the previous uh, arab domination of much of the middle east north africa and even spain so that's pretty much the reason you know so when you have individuals such as uh, you know such as uh, al khwarizmi or even uh, you know ibn sina or nasr al-din al-tusi many arabs may claim well look uh, you know uh, they they were likely arabs because they had arabic names but the truth is that this is not really the case Anyhow, uh, even many of the early, uh, you know, the, the individuals, the Sunni theologians, those who are responsible for the formation of the Sunni schools of thought, as well as even the Shiite school of thoughts, were largely Iranians, you know, of the four major schools, uh, Ibn al um, uh, the so-called, you know, uh, Abu Hanifa, he was actually a Persian, and uh, many of uh, the uh, those who uh, kept the Hadith, so the Hadith, which forms the basis of uh, the Islamic religion, they were all Persians, all six of them were actually Persians, and and many Muslims know this as well 
and uh, so it's pretty much clear here that the Islamic religion as well as Islamic civilization has a lot to owe to the Persian people and not the other way around you know the Arab invasion was not a blessing for Iran or Iranians it's the other way around the Arab conquest of Iran was a blessing for not only the Islamic faith but also the Arab people yeah but anyways uh, that's uh, pretty much it uh, Another thing I actually wanted to highlight here was that many other scholars later on, such as Ferdowsi as well as uh, Omar Hayam, actually uh, lamented uh, about the Arab conquest as well as the Islamic faith, you know. And uh, it really shows that for a very long time, Iranians had a lot of uh, hostility towards Arabs, even those uh, who contributed greatly to the uh, Islamic tradition, even they were somewhat hostile to the Arabs. And uh, this was obvious, you know, for 200 years, their nation was occupied by the Arabs and they were forced to speak the Arabic language against their will. And uh, for a culture as strong as that of the Persians, it was obviously not something that they wanted to do. And uh, if you look today, the Persian people are the only people who manage to maintain their culture as well as their uh, various different aspects of their cultures, pre-Islamic aspects, which you see nowhere else in uh, the uh, Islamic world. You know, much of the native uh, Semitic speaking populations in the Middle East are extinct because of the Arabic expansions, rather because of the Arabic ex expansion and the expansion of the Arabic language. As well as in North Africa, there's really nothing there. You know, uh, most of the population has been Arabized. You know, the Berbers form a very small minority. And uh, even in Spain, uh, for a very long time, the Arabic language dominated and the majority of the population was Arabized. But nonetheless, the Persians managed to, ho managed to hold out against these constant uh, Arab assaults and managed to preserve their culture as well as uh, various aspects of uh, their uh, old uh, pre-Islamic traditions. And this is really, really the critical point here. The only reason why the Islamic Golden Age occurred as to the height as it did was because of the preservation of the Persian culture and the Persian tradition by the Iranian people and not because of the intellectual capacities of the Arabs. You know what's really interesting is that it's very silly to attribute uh, intellectual as well as uh, academic uh, related successes to a single religion you know. No one calls uh, European related uh, golden ages as the Christian golden age you know. No one calls uh, Chinese related golden ages as the Buddhist golden age. So why should uh, there be a term for the Islamic related uh, you know the uh, rather the Persian related golden ages or the golden ages of the Middle East. Why is it often called the Islamic Golden Age or uh, less so the Arab Golden Age. The truth of the, is and the fact of the matter here is that Arabs or Muslims really did not have a great deal of uh, you know they did not have really they were not Islam was not the reason neither were the Arabs for these successes largely it was due to the strong uh, culture and traditions of the Persian people. Finally there is something else to take into account here and that is that uh, you know many Muslims view this period as a collective golden age for their own traditions. You know, you have Muslims in India, you have Muslims in uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, you have Muslims in North Africa, you know, claiming that, yeah, you know, these individuals are Muslims and that's why we have a right to this heritage, when in actuality, religion should really have nothing to do with it. You know, you don't really see, you know, it's not really that there's anything wrong with this, but collectively claiming that this was some sort of miracle work of the Islamic faith is wrong. When, because the reality is that all of this uh, rich cultural heritage and this great uh, deal of intellectual achievement belongs to the Iranian people and the Persian people specifically and uh, not really to these other uh, individuals who claim it, specifically Arabs from the peninsula. Now I don't have anything against them but I just think that for them to appropriate the culture and civilization of the Iranian peoples is completely wrong because they should actually be grateful to the Iranian people, specifically the Persians, for all the great contributions they made to the Islamic religion, to the so-called Islamic civilization as well as uh, to the uh, development of the intellectual capacities of uh, the Arabs. That's uh, pretty much it for this video. I really have nothing else to say. Uh, I think the video, I, I really have nothing else to say again. I think uh, this video speaks for itself, so please do share it uh, as much as you can and get the word out. I think uh, many Muslims and many uh, Arabs need to know that uh, much of the Islamic Golden Age was actually a product of the Iranian people and uh, the Persians specifically, again, and uh, had little to do with the Islamic faith. You know, this is a very controversial topic, and many individuals do not actually want to uh, accept the realities, but nonetheless, uh, you know, history speaks for itself.